recording before that? No. That would have got a million views. That's hilarious. <laughs> All right, so um, the oxygen side curve. So remember from yesterday, we went over this, right? Yeah. Okay, let's go over it again because it's super important. You're going to see it on the uh, test and quite possibly on the AP exam. So the oxygen side curve basically shows what happens to levels of dissolved oxygen, which organisms in water need, and it also describes what happens with the BOD, or biochemical oxygen demand, um, which is the amount of oxygen that organisms need to break organic waste and stuff down in the water that's, that's dying. It could be like from an algal bloom, it could be from sewage in plants. And so basically what you're looking at here in my fancy drawing, you have this input of sewage, which is these squiggly black lines that I've drawn here, so nice and neat. And then dissolved oxygen is pretty high until we get up to this sewage. And the dissolved oxygen um, drops from the top and goes all the way down. And it does that for what reason, Emma? Because the things that are breaking down the sewage need more oxygen. Yeah, so the biochemical oxygen demand, these organisms, it's the oxygen that's demanded that they need to break down stuff. And so when the sewage comes in, their, their need for oxygen goes way, way up. The level of oxygen then goes down, um, it makes it drop from the top and it goes all the way down and then eventually it goes back up when, Will? Whenever there's not a lot, a lot of sewage left. Yeah, once the sewage is broken down and diffused, then those levels go back up. And then also you'll see the biological oxygen demand because you don't need as much oxygen because there's not as much stuff to break down, then it returns to normal. So this is the BOD curve, yeah I guess there's two of them. Um, and you just need to make sure you know the relationship between those two things, okay? So, on page 391 in the book at the top, there's a picture of? Uh, creek. Yeah, you got a little creek or stream here, and it's kind of reddish in color from what? Clay. Not clay. Sulfur. Although it kind of looks like clay. Sulfur. Acid mine drainage, primarily from iron. Very good. <clears throat> a lot of times where you see iron seeps, they'll look like this. Um, and somewhere here close by, there's been a mine, and so there's been some drainage of different iron and other chemicals. One of the problems is the acids that leak from there, or even the heavy metals, those can cause issues in that stream. I would suspect that um, there's probably not a, thing, a lot of things living in that stream. I probably would not want to eat a fish out of that stream, and I would not want my kids to jump around and play in that stream. So those are problems when you have mines that are improperly um, tidied up when they are finished. And so a lot of times oh, mines are just left and then when it rains and stuff drains out, then you have a lot of acids or heavy metals or other chemicals that can leach out and seep out into bodies of water and cause um, aquatic pollution, okay? So mining, that's one of our big concerns. You guys, as we go toward renewable or sustainable energy sources, we're gonna have to have lots more of what? What do you have to have if you've got, if you're using like renewable energy sources? You have to have batteries. You have to have batteries. You have to have something to store some of that energy, especially with solar and wind. And so to get batteries, what are they made of? Lithium, you've got cobalt, you've got nickel, you got cadmium. All of these are either really nasty metals or salts, and I think most of them are salts. And then sometimes lead, a lot of batteries are lead. Um, I know my kids bought, they got one of those little uh, electric dirt bikes, and I had to replace the batteries on it the other day. Anyway, and so there's a lot of very harmful chemicals that goes into making those batteries. In order to get those chemicals, you have to mine them out of somewhere. And if you're not careful about how you mine them, then they're gonna get into streams and rivers and creeks and bodies of water around you. Um, lithium is a big issue. There's a lot of it mined out in South America and Bolivia. There's a huge lithium mine or some, it's like salt flats. And um, one of the big issues I read the other day was that in order to get the lithium out, it consumes large amounts of fresh water. And so farmers in the area that would normally use that water for irrigation, it was becoming unavailable. And so there's just kind of this cascade of issues that occurs when we're trying to extract those things for batteries. I suspect that will be more and more prevalent in the years to come when um, we have to deal with this transition from fossil fuels 
to EV vehicles is what about, do we have enough batteries to power all those? We're currently only maybe a couple, 2% or so of the vehicles on the road are electric. Like what happens when we go all electric, like California's trying to in 15 years or GM's trying to in 15 years? Um, what happens when we no longer um, are using elect, uh, fossil fuels to produce electricity? Like, are we gonna be able to store that energy that's produced from solar and wind? So some of the issues that we've discussed, I think these are gonna continue to come up and continue to be problematic. Germany still hasn't really solved their switch over. Remember we talked about they've invested in the past 15 years or so in huge investments into moving to solar and wind, but they also still have to have lots of fossil fuels to, to fill in the gaps when there's not enough solar and wind energy. Um, and so that's going to be a problem. And also we're going to need additional electricity for what purpose? More than we use now besides just the population growing. When people are driving now, what do they use mostly for energy to power the cars? Gas. And in the future, it's going to be, it's looking like it's going to be electric. So you're going to have to have extra electricity to power those vehicles. Do what? Yeah, I mean, I guess the hope would be we reduce our energy usage somewhat and become more efficient, but I still think that's a that's a lot of energy that you're going to have to transition over to. And gasoline is a very dense fuel source compared to batteries. It takes lots and lots of batteries to equal like the same amount of energy output as gasoline. Oh, and speaking of energy output, I think I read earlier, the, uh, I saw this on, on a tweet or something the other day, that, um, you know, we consume calories in food that we eat, like a Coke or something, maybe has, what, like 120 calories or a couple hundred calories, depending on how big it is. A gram of uranium, a gram's not very big, um, contains, I want to say it was like 18 million calories, like a ridiculous amount of energy. So when you're thinking about like how energy dense stuff is, that's something to consider, these different energy sources, how much energy is actually contained in a small area. What if you ate that? You well, you'd probably die from the radiation, so I don't know about that. But that's not like energy like that would provide energy to us. Calorie is just a unit of energy that we use um, in most foods. But um, it's, what is it? A, a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to heat up like a gram of water, one degree Celsius or something like that. So that's all it's talking about. We could all use hybrid cars because my Prius, I didn't have to plug it up and charge it, but I only had to get gas like once every two weeks. Can you plug it up and charge it? Or could you? No. Oh. It's just like parking. See, that's different now because like, um, did we go out one day and look at Miss... Uh, we did not. Would you, I, I, I ask her, I, we'll, get, we'll go out there one day when we're not too busy and get her to sh show us her car. She's got a new Chrysler hybrid um, minivan. And Miss Woodruff? The counselor? 12th grade. 12th grade. No, she's my she's our yeah, okay, maybe that's why. Anyway, she has a hybrid um, van, and in the back, there's a gas tank filler, and in the front, there's a plug-in for where you can plug it in, so if you just want to use all electric. Do you guys know if in your car, if you hit the braking gas at the same time, it takes a screenshot? Yep. Really? What kind of car takes a screenshot? It's oh, my Jeep. I've got my Jeep. It's my Jeep. Why would it do that? It was a joke. He's trying to get you to blow out your crash. <laughs> I'm trying to what? That would damage your car. It would. Um, there's a lot of people who drive like that, so. I was like, somebody needs an email for that. No. You ever seen somebody driving down the road at just a normal speed and their brake lights on the whole time? Yep. Yeah, they got two feet on, well, one on each one. Anyway, don't drive like that and don't ever listen to. Um, one foot. I drive 70 plus. What? How are you able to keep going about They're driving with both feet. Oh, my sister drives with both feet. That's how you have that problem. Okay. Who? Harrison Lynch. <laughs> no comment. All right, number nine. Blank, 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 blank. Where do we go with number nine? Okay, um, did we talk about this one yesterday, the heavy metals? Um, we got to number eight. Heavy metal. Okay, well, okay, we talked about number eight. We didn't do number eight. We didn't do number eight at all? I filled in number eight just with my brain. Number eight was the graph. We didn't do that one yeah, yesterday? we did the graph. We just did okay, we didn't talk about it. An oxygen sag curve is a plot of dissolved oxygen versus the distance from a source of pollution. So the amount of dissolved oxygen from that source of pollutant, okay, usually excess nutrients or I'm going to say organic waste, 
Um, you can say sewage if you want to. The College Board uses the, the term biological refuse, but I don't feel like that's something that most people use. Yeah. Um, so basically where those excess nutrients or sewage comes into play. And like I said, the important thing about the oxygen sag curve is oxygen gets depleted when excess nutrients or organic waste comes into a body of water because bacteria are having to break those nutrients or waste down. And so oxygen declines. So that's something you got to worry about. And I'm sure you guys have heard of lots of areas in and around the U.S., even around Alabama. We have quite a few where there's a sewage leak and then there's a fish kill. Tyson had a huge um, leak of something at one of their plants up in Coleman. Y'all remember this a couple years ago? And it got in the Black Warrior River and there were just like fish dead everywhere. Yes, yeah, the Tyson chicken plant. And so I think maybe it was like sewage or like um, waste that was left over from breaking them down. I can't remember exactly what the waste was, but some of the tanks blew. And like all that leaked into, it was the, the Black Warrior River. And then the whole Black Warrior tasted like chicken nuggets. I don't think it tastes like chicken nuggets. I think it was more of a sewage and waste issue. All right, number nine, heavy metals. Heavy metals, not like you guys are thinking of on the radio. Um, lead, mercury, arsenic, things of that nature, used for industry, especially mining or burning fossil fuels, can reach the groundwater, impacting the drinking water supply, or also the, could impact the irrigation water. Now, it's one thing if it impa impacts the, the drinking water supply. That's going to be what we're taking in directly. Maybe you're really smart, Michael, and you're like, hey, that drinking water is super nasty right there. I'm going to drink some bottled water. If you water your corn with that, then it's going to go into the corn. Yeah, and so this is a problem that was brought up in a video we watched a couple weeks ago. They talked about cancer villages in China. You remember this? Yeah. And so I don't. there's a video I've got somewhere. I don't know if I've showed it to you this year where um, in some of these cancer villages, one of the biggest problems is not just consumption of the water. It's they're using water from those streams and creeks and stuff to water and irrigate their fields. Well, if those streams and creeks and fields have very toxic chemicals, heavy metals or other chemicals from plants that are that are very harmful, then a lot of times the plants are gonna absorb that. It's like the and, Chernobyl thing where the dude was eating strawberry jam. Yeah, yeah, the guys were eating the, the jam or the mushrooms or whatever from Chernobyl and they were consuming that chemical. And so I think maybe you guys in ag class talked about this the other day. Somebody asked me about bioremediation did y'all talk about that? We'll get into bioremediation later on. Sometimes that's a good thing. Plants can absorb some harmful chemicals from the soil. So let's say you have an industrial plant leak and you have a bunch of like toxic chemicals leak out onto the ground, carson, some mercury or arsenic or something like that, and you in like a very kind of large area, and you're like, how am I going to clean this up? I mean, are you going to dig up everything in that area and take it off and put it in a landfill somewhere? Well, you'd have to put it in a hazardous waste landfill. It'd be hard to do. But let's say that you could plant some plants there that would absorb that. You could pull the plants out, and then you could just remove them. So it's a way of taking the bad stuff out of the soil. It'd be a lot easier to do and a lot more feasible. So that's kind of a part of bioremediation. The bad side of that would be, let's say the plants are taking it out of there and then you're consuming those plants though. Or it's, you've already got a polluted area and you didn't know it, you're planting stuff there or you're using polluted water and then the plants are taking that in and you're consuming it, you're giving it to your kids. The rates of cancer are very high. That's what we see a lot of times in some of these cancer villages. Um, most notably the ones I've heard of are in China, but I'm sure there's some in other locations. So, number, ele number 10. Litter. I tell you what, I almost chased down somebody the other day. Don't do this. Um, I thought better of it. It was in the morning, and we were over here at the corner of uh, Patriot and Old Marion Road, and a woman pulled up to the stop sign, and she went before me, and she's turned right, so I started going forward, and she rolled down her window right as she was turning right and just took like a big styrofoam cup, I think probably from like Jack's or somewhere, or maybe a gas station. She chucked it out the window. And like I yelled and laid on the horn a little bit, and I don't doubt she heard me, but um, it was very disconcerting to see just how cavalier she was about just chunking that out the window. And um, so anyway, 
I don't, I mean, and you guys can see this. Y'all don't have to drive up and down too many roads around here. If there's a creek at the bottom of the hill and somebody's got some trash, beer bottles. then it's going to go in there. Yeah, what is it about? I mean, gosh. Because you're intoxicated and you just throw it out the So many beer bottles and cans. So many. And then there's a ton of plastic water bottles. Um, I probably get as many plastic Coke bottles and water bottles as I do beer cans and beer bottles. I'm trying to think what else. A large number of cigarette packets. Um, and sometimes they just throw out like little Walmart bags full of trash for somebody else to pick up. The problem is like where I live over here, it's on a hill and at the bottom of the road is um, Little Sandy Creek, the same creek that runs behind Hinton Place and the one that crosses out there below Inglewood. Mm -hmm. So if if it rains heavy and that trash on the side of the road makes its way down to Little Sandy, then it's gonna go down Little Sandy and about a mile or two, it's gonna make its way to what? Black the Black Warrior River. And once it's in the Black Warrior River, where's it headed? The ocean. So these are things we have to consider. Um, I, I just never understand this kind of narcissistic attitude of where like, I'm only thinking about me. I'm not thinking about anybody else. I'm not thinking about the trash that I'm throwing out, the way it looks. Um, it affects people's property values. It affects the environment. I'm only thinking about what I want to do, and it just seems like there's no conscious about that, which um, is really disheartening. But anyway, litter that reaches aquatic systems besides the unsightly can create intestinal blockage and choking hazards for wildlife and introduce toxic substances in the food chain. Now, I have to look it up here. One day next week, we're going to watch a video there's a number of, let's turn over here on page, this is near book, on page 397. This is one of the most polluted rivers in the world, the uh, Sitarum, and this is in Indonesia. And we will watch a video on this, I got a pretty good one, that shows kind of what the problems and issues are here, but I'll just give you a little sneak peek. This is not rocks, you can't walk across this, this is just trash floating on top of this river, okay? And most of it's from cities or villages and places in and around this river. They will just like back up to the river banks and dump all their trash. And when it rains, it just flows right into it. It's, it's like nuts. It's crazy. Um, and then some of the industrial plants, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but a lot of our clothing and textile material is made in Indonesia. And um, some of these textile plants will have like a pipe direct running directly from the plant with like dyes and tans and things that they're using and just straight pop it right out into this river. And so this is one of the nastiest, worst rivers there. I remember one, one thing in the video, there was just like a dead goat floating around and there's dead fish all over the place. Um, it's just disgusting. I don't, I don't know how people can't see like, hey, let's clean this up. And there are a group of people there that are trying to but it seems as though it's kind of a losing battle almost. Most of the plastics and litter that are in the oceans is coming from what region on Earth? China. Um, Southeast Asia, yeah. I wanna say it's roughly about 80% or so. So it, it is a lot of waste going into streams, rivers, and then into the ocean, which we'll talk more about, okay? So, where we go? go let's go back to litter. Um, blocking ha hazards. So there's lots of good videos on the internet where on like beaches out in the middle of the ocean where there's like a little island or atoll or something, you'll see a bunch of dead birds. And then if you cut open the dead birds, what do they find in their stomachs? Plastics, Plastics mostly. And a lot of it is just like, I want a drink. Yeah, I know bottle caps. Not. Bottle caps are made from a different plastic than the other parts. And so, plastic. yeah, it's harder plastic. And so you'll see like a ton of bottle caps or pieces of toothbrushes or just other plastic stuff in their stomachs. And you can tell they've eaten this thinking it was some little fish or jellyfish or something in the sea. And they were trying to they just swallow stuff whole. It's not like they're sitting there tasting it. And then they can't digest it and they die. They just starve to death basically because their stomachs are full of this plastic stuff. And so it's a tragedy that you see all around the place. There was a well. Did y'all hear about that well that had those plastic bags? It was like 50 or 100 pounds of plastic bags in its stomach. It washed up on shore, I think, in um, England, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, 
Sea turtles, they eat a lot of plastic bags for what? Why would they eat a plastic bag? Because they use a jellyfish, yeah. They like straws. I've seen that one video where the straw is stuck in its nose or something. I don't know how many straws they're actually eating. I think plastic bags are probably a bigger concern. This whole like straw thing, yeah, I'm all for like, you know, picking up trash and um, getting rid of your stuff where it should be. I don't know that straws are our biggest issue. Um, I think we have a lot of other larger plastic problems, but anyway, I think we should all try to do a good job of getting rid of all that plastic. Do what? Things have changed, haven't they? All right, number 11, increased sediment in waterways. Sediment is the number one what? Pollutant. Pollutant of aquatic systems. Remember that. Sediment means dirt. So where people on land expose dirt, normally like stuff grows on dirt, and it's not exposed, and you don't have that much runoff. But when dirt is exposed on land, and it rains, and it floods, then it gets washed off, which can affect light infiltration. You don't have light, you don't have what, Carson? What? If you don't have light, you don't have photosynthesis. Thanks, Carson. Oh, you're welcome. And which can affect primary producers, which are undergoing photosynthesis, and also visual predators. Why would that affect them, Will? Because they can't find them. Can't find their prey. It also affects the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. Well, that's my okay. I don't know if sediment's affecting direct, directly affecting dissolved oxygen. How would it do that? Because the light can't hit the... I guess the if the plants are producing a lot, yes, it would reduce it that way. Okay. And it Maybe. I don't know if that's a huge impact, but that's definitely a problem with not having the plants available for food. Um, let's see what else. Sediment can also settle disrupting habitats. What zone would it be disrupting? What do we call the floor of a body of water? Uh, ocean surface. The surface? The floor? Bottom. 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 Yeah. Bottom. Thank you, Cassie. Benthic zone, good. Yeah. So the benthic zone is what we have to worry about, yeah. So some of that can settle out and cover those um, sediment. Can, basically, you're smothering out any plants that are growing in the benthic zone. Um, number 12. When elemental sources of mercury enter aquatic environments, bacteria in the water convert it to a highly toxic methyl mercury. Now, we talked a little bit about this in, turn to 390 if you will. We talked a little bit about this in um, the Cove. Do y'all remember what they said about, we didn't watch the whole thing, did we? No, no, no. We did not. Um, what, why are pregnant women advised to not eat tuna or to eat very limited amounts? Because it hurts the baby. Tuna eats something no. smaller. That also eats mercury. Smaller. Mercury. mercury. Yeah. So there's a higher mercury content in tuna, and really, it depends on, like, the fancy rich tuna, I guess we could say, usually contains more than the cheap canned tuna because that's usually smaller tuna. Um, but they all have a, certain, a higher amount. Any, any kind of aquatic, like, higher-level animal is going to contain higher levels of mercury um, in their body tissues. So it builds up as you go up the food chain. In fact, in Alabama... It's kind of hard. It's hard to find a river or a pond or lake around here that is safe to eat um, catfish, some catfish, and a lot of largemouth bass because these things are high up in the food chain. They've got a lot of mercury. Dolphins, they've got a ridiculous amount of mercury, and so that's one of the kind of the controversies with eating dolphins in Japan is why would you want to eat them? They're, we would basically consider them toxic waste because of the high levels of mercury in their body tissues. So it doesn't really make sense. Shark fin soup or something like that. Sharks, I'm sure, would probably have pretty high levels too. Now, they give advisories. You can look online for what the tuna advisories are. Usually it's for pregnant women and younger children. And then once you get older, there's usually not as much of a concern once your brain is developed. Remember that mercury has a serious side effect on your brain function. Yes, on your neur neurons. Basically, yeah, it's, it's deadly to neurons. It makes you crazy. It makes you dumber. It, it kills brain cells, so mm -hmm. probably yeah, lots of those things. Of All right, 381, real quick. On 381, let's talk about hermaphrodites. Whoa. Wait, what page? The frogs that change genders because of the chemicals in the water. We are actually going to watch a video on the frogs that change gender. Did we talk about that already? Yeah. 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 
We talked about bio. Yeah, in Jurassic no. Park. So, in the Troubled Waters video that we're going to, we won't have time today. We'll start tomorrow. We are going to watch a video, and um, it talks about frogs that are exposed to a pesticide and their sex organs. The males start producing eggs. On 381, got the same thing in the Chesapeake Bay here, except with fish. 81 percent, no, is that 82? 82% of female smallmouth bass develop into hermaphrodites with male sex organs that um, start producing female eggs. And so these are all called, the chemicals that do this are called endocrine disruptors. Endocrine means hormone. Har your hormone system. And so it affects your hormones, how they're produced, like for instance, Testosterone and estrogen, if you look at those two chemical compounds, they're almost identical. There's only one little small change at the top of each one. And so it's not very difficult to go from making one to making the other. And so you have this effect that results. This can also affect humans, but probably not as, as significantly. Um, but I know in the same video, they talk about like sperm development is hindered with exposure to a lot of chemicals. I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where boys are producing eggs, but anyway, um, we do see this in some other animals like frogs and fish. Endocrine disruptors, well, let's finish up here, number 14, let's see. Oh, we didn't do 13, did we? All right, number 13. Endocrine disruptors are chemicals that can interfere with the endocrine system, so the hormone system. Number 14, they can lead to birth defects, okay? Which, mental issues or other issues and how body the body is formed. Developmental disorders, that's mostly cognitive issues with the brain. And gender imbalances in fish and frogs and maybe a few other species. Okay, so the endocrine disruptor is a big problem. It shows up a lot, on, a lot of times on apes tests because it's so significant um, in how it affects organisms. All right, you guys take care. All right.